class so far, we've had an opportunity to take a look at one-way independent groups of novas and repeated measures groups of nova, or repeated measures of novas both in one way. And now we're going to get a chance to do it in the factorial. As you've seen in class, we've started to have some repetition across our ANOVA assignments. And instead of adding more repetition in the class, I'm going to introduce repeated measures factorial ANOVA and mixed factorial ANOVA through video. Here, you still get exposed to it, especially if you're doing it for your thesis, but you won't have to have the same repetition in class. So in this video, we're going to take a look at a 2x4 repeated measures factorial ANOVA. This data comes from Stefano Pietrovano's thesis in Strength and Conditioning a couple of years ago. The purpose of the study is to determine if an eccentric exercise or concentric exercise elicits greater post-activation potentiation as measured by vertical jump over time. If we take a look at his example, his independent variable was exercise type, where he did either a 3R repeated measures back squat or a super back maximal front squat. So you have that categorical variable or the nominal variable. Everybody did both conditions of that and then they did it over five different time periods. Baseline, immediately after the vertical jump, two minutes after the vertical jump, four minutes, six minutes, and eight minutes. Then his dependent variable was height and vertical jump. His substantive hypothesis was that while resistance trained males are expected to have similar jumps at that baseline, when they complete the super maximal, super maximal front squat, vertical jump was expected to increase at a higher rate than over the eight minutes than at the vertical jump. If we think of that as to what that looks like in a interaction chart, you would have both groups here and you'd have some effect in that 3RM front squat, but he was looking for something along these lines in the uh, super maximal front squat. And you can see how that's going to elicit an inter a significant interaction. So just like before, we did have the three statistical hypotheses, one for each of the F tests. It starts off with the interaction effect, because that is our major question, so no significant interaction between exercise type and time with respect to vertical jump. Then those backup hypotheses for each of the main effects. No significant mean difference is expected in vertical jump height in the or between 3RM back squat and super maximal. So that's for exercise type, and then one for time. No significant mean difference is expected in vertical jump across the five time periods. In SPSS, because it is repeated measures, remember that you're going to set your data up so that you have each level of the independent variable is going to make up a column, and then the dependent variable is going to populate the columns. Because it's a factorial, each level has to really be a combination. So here's that super maximal at baseline the 3RM at baseline, super maximal immediately after vertical jump, 3RM after vertical jump, and so on. So he needed every combination to make up he had a two by f or excuse me, a two by five. He needed ten columns to deal with a two by five. When looking at how the variance was gonna get proportioned, we still have that same idea that we saw both in the one way repeated measures where we have the between subjects is a constant that's get, gonna get pulled out and then we have explained comes from within groups variance and unexplained also comes from within groups variance. But now, because we have two independent variables and an interaction term, we're gonna subdivide within groups variance to be what's explained by exercise type, what's explained by time, and what's explained by the interaction. Knowing that this interaction term is what we're gonna test first, and then we'll test the two backup main effects if we have a non-significant interaction. So this is what the Mochley's test looks for. Uh, we need to check all three of these Mochley's tests. We see that for interaction, we have not met the assumption here, 0.034, so we're gonna end up using the greenhouse geyser effect for our greenhouse geyser adjustment for our interaction. For condition or for time, we'll go up to time next. Same thing, we still have violated the assumption because P is less than 0.05. Now, the next question here is why is there no P value for condition? Think about what the variable is. Condition has two levels. Condition is going to be exercise type, so it's back squat and front squat, or the eccentric and the concentric exercise. In that situation, when we have those two different situations, think about how we did a repeated measures t-test. Never had an assumption of homogeneity variance because we only had two groups, or two 
two conditions. Therefore, when you made a distrib or difference distribution, so our difference distribution looked like here, it was only going to be one dis difference distribution. It was going to be back squat minus front squat for each person. With only one distribution, we have a constant. We can't actually test for it. So there is no value here. We're going to assume homogeneity, and we're going to use this for the assumed line for condition. So taking a look at the SPSS, remember you start with your interaction. We did violate the assumption, so we're going to read the greenhouse geyser line. I'm going to zoom this in for you a little bit. So we'll read the greenhouse geyser line. We go across, we get to the sig value, 0.037, suggests that we have a significant interaction, and we have a partially to squared about 18%, which is a very large effect, so we're doing pretty good there. If we had looked at the main effects, if the interaction hadn't been significant, for condition or for exercise type, we'll see that there was a significant difference between front squat, and, or the eccentric and the concentric, and for time, we also see a difference. Those, however, don't really matter because we do have a significant interaction. So we're going to go ahead and do our post hoc for the interaction, which is the simple effects test. And I've put here what the interaction chart looks like for you, and you can see how it doesn't, or it does deviate from parallel. Now we do have kind of a decrease that looks somewhat parallel, but we have them starting about the same place, which is what we'd hypothesize because of the random assignment into, or the random counterbalancing. We have a bigger decrement in condition two, which is the 3RM, than in the supermaximal, and then we have a bigger increase in supermaximal than we did in the 3RM. Notice that we also see the 3RM plateau faster over time than the supermaximal. And that'll play out in your simple effects tests. So a simple effects test, when you have a repeated measures design, you really do need to look at the pairwise comparisons, not just the univariate test for the simple effects test. So at time one, which is his baseline measure, we can see that between the supermaximal and the condition, there was no significant difference. This is what we'd expect, again, due to random balancing. But then once we employ, or they've now experienced the condition, so immediately after vertical jump, we can see there's a significant difference. Then two minutes later, a significant difference. Then we have, at four minutes later, a significant difference, significant difference at five, significant difference at six. We do have a differential outcome here, which is what's driving the significant interaction. We have no significance up here where all the other ones are statistically significant. So with that differential outcome, we had a significant interaction. The statement of the finding, at baseline, no significant mean difference was found between vertical jumps in 3RM back squat and supermaximal fat squat. At 2, 4, 6, and 8, resistance trained athletes jumped significantly higher in the supermaximal condition than compared to the 3RM. And then we have the conclusion statement with the removed, you know, saying the same thing, but we have removed the statistical jargon. I want to include the simple effects test information. This is all available for you. Um, in Moodle, what you have here is uh, the what you would put into syntax, making sure, as you can see, he had to change the variable names to match. So we have all the different 10 columns. We have time 6, polynomial condition 2, condition 2, time 6, so 6 time periods, uh, polynomial um, tables, time by condition, compare condition. Here's what the Fisher test looks like if I were to have a main effect for time, if I, if I didn't have a significant interaction. This is what I would look for, looking across time. Or I would have the alternative, because I didn't remember I, didn't, um, I had a significant outcome. Um, so I could do also a polynomial contrast because I had equal increments of time there. So if I take a look here, you know, I, and I take a look to see which is my highest order of significance, did not have a significant, we'd start up at the fifth order and work our way down. And since the fifth order is statistically significant, that would suggest I have four bends in the data. And I think we could sort of see that plot out, that if we had balanced the data here, it started high, it bended down, it started to come back up. So then 
it went up again, went down a little bit, came back up. So we can see how there were multiple bends coming in this data and why we have a significant fifth order. Now, if you wanted to check the main effect for condition, it's only two levels because it's exercise or eccentric and concentric. In that case, you would just look for the mean difference to figure out which group was higher or lower.